Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for being here today. My name is Carrie Michaels and I work with the Children, Youth and Family Consortium in Extension at the University of Minnesota. Together with MACMA, we sponsor this day-long research to practice training series every year. This is our fifth annual year um, of doing this partnership and each time we uh, focus on a particular topic for a whole day because the people coming to this event wanted more research, more in-depth study, and we also love working with MACMA and reaching all of you with some of the research that comes from the University of Minnesota and elsewhere. Um, so we are very excited about this year um, because we're spending time discussing a topic that uh, to some is unknown and yet is receiving more and more attention in the press, in our research, in our practices, in our schools, in our clinics. Um, so thank you for being with us today. This is the first of three sessions on this topic for the whole day. The topic is strengthening families in the context of incarceration. And I'm just excited that we have many of us looking at this topic in a much more in-depth way. Um, as, I, as you all know, you have many choices of sessions to attend at MACMA. Each, each session throughout the day, you have 11 or 12 choices. So I thank you for choosing this one. Um, we will have 150 more of us paying attention to the needs of kids who are affected by incarceration. Um, CYFC, where I work, has uh, focused a lot of our time and energy for the past year on this topic of parental incarceration. You were given a um, document that looks like this. This is a publication that we produce called the Children's Mental Health E-Review, and we put out this uh, issue last June, and it's called Children with Incarcerated Parents, Considering Children's Outcomes in the Context of Complex Family Experiences. And I want to note in particular that we have an incentive about this um, for all of you um, related to this issue and other e-review issues right now. There's a link inside the front cover to an evaluation survey, and if you read the issue and go to the link and fill out our evaluation survey, your name will be entered in a drawing for a free registration for our upcoming Lessons from the Field event, which is next fall. Some of you have probably participated in those. Um, our event in the fall is called Secondary Traumatic Stress, Building Resilience for Professionals, and it will happen on October 30th. So please do consider reading this and then also completing the survey. Um, also in November, we held a Lessons from the Field event. Um, did anyone participate in that last November? So not very many. So we have a very new audience. That's great. Um, we, our Lessons from the Field series uh, is um, directed by Judy Myers, who is in the back. Can you wave, Judy? <laughs> Judy is on our staff and also a MACMA board member and is here helping us today. Um, and we had an event in November on this same topic with some of our same presenters. Um, and then, as you heard from Rebecca this morning, Sesame Street has also focused a great deal of attention on this topic. And so you also have a kit that Sesame Street has produced uh, in front of you. We have more kits in the back, so if you want to take more, there's also a kit request form. Feel free to take that if you want to order more in the future. Uh, we also, on our back table, have several other resources I just want to draw your attention to before introducing our speakers. Um, we have uh, uh, tips for incarcerated parents for you to hand out to parents that you work with. Um, we have a children's book list. So uh, Rebecca and one of her graduate students reviewed a bunch of children's books that have content related to family incarceration and rated them. And you can see... Um, what the books are, what they were rated, um, a summary of each book. Feel free to pick up whatever you need on the table. We also have Jason Soule, one of our speakers, new book. It looks like this. And they're actually for sale down in the exhibit hall. You can pick up a bookmark or a flyer in the back to remind you, but at the MACMA table, you can purchase the book. Um, and we also have a sign up in case you want to receive a monthly email about um, issues, resources, events, topics related to parental incarceration and other topics related to children's mental health. You can sign up in the back. Um, there's also a flyer about the film that we're going to show later today. Um, so I want to um, just ask Bobby Blanchard to wave your hand, show everybody who you are. Bobby is here as host of the film, which will be shown in the session after lunch. Um, it will take up our whole session, so that will be what we do for that second workshop. Um, but the Mothers of Bedford film is a um, 
a very moving and special, moving film and special part of our day. There's a flyer in the back in case you're interested in either purchasing or renting the film for your own viewing later on. Um, so feel free to take information about that. And then just a couple of other logistics. Um, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones or turn them to vibrate. Uh, today's sessions will be recorded and posted on the Children, Youth, and Family Consortium's website, which you will see either inside the cover of this e-review or on a bookmark in the back that looks like this. Um, so if you want to pick up a bookmark, Sarah's holding them up in the back. Um, you can um, receive announcements in the future. Um, also, in addition to the short MACMA survey that you get with each of the workshops here, we have a pre-survey that we handed to you as you came in the door. If you could fill that out, um, it would be helpful to us to both know a little bit more about your interests and also how to keep offering these kinds of sessions in the future in ways that meet your needs. So if you could take a moment now to complete the survey and then pass it to the aisle, we'll come up and down the aisles and collect them. Um, and then the last thing is, just because you showed up today, we want to offer some of you, if you're lucky, a door prize. We have um, both a book that looks like this. It's written by Deborah Stein, who was born in prison and writes about her experiences. Um, and we also have another book um, that is on that book list review um, about a kid uh, with some um, experiences related to parental incarceration. If you look under your chair, right in the front, and if you find one of these bookmarks, then you are a winner. So if you have a bookmark, if you can just raise it in the air, raise your hand in the air, Sarah will come around and give you a book. And as she is doing that, I'm going to just ask for your attention so that we can move on to our speakers. Again, if you have a bookmark, please raise your hand way up in the air so that she can see you. And then if I can have your attention again. All right, so I would like to introduce um, briefly Jason Soule and Rebecca Schlafer. Uh, you already met Rebecca this morning. Um, you will learn a lot more about Jason as he speaks to you this morning. A um, uh, few notes about him. He was born and raised in Chicago, and after a life including the presence of gangs and firearms and drug dealing, he is here to talk about his experiences with incarceration, with resilience, with the supports that he's had in his life, and with healing in his life. He is currently pursuing a doctor, doctoral degree in criminal justice and is a faculty member at Metro State University. And then you've already heard from Rebecca. Dr. Schlafer has dedicated her research and training career to this topic of parental incarceration. She's an assistant professor in the Division of General Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And she's spoken on this topic to a wide range of audiences, including the White House. Um, and she, as she mentioned this morning, is also a guardian ad litem, so works with kids uh, directly. Um, and so I would like to welcome both of them. Jason will be speaking with you first, and then Rebecca will speak after that. Thank you. How you guys doing? Good? Fired up about the book you just received or didn't receive? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm glad you chose this session. Um, what I do in this session is I, I tell you my journey. I explain it, um, not to glamorize it or glorify, but just to tell the story. It's important that we provide the narratives. Um, that's extremely important in this work. So I want to tell you the story because it is a story that's um, um, been able to create change in a lot of different modalities. So I'm, it's an honor and privilege to even be able to talk about the things that I can talk about. So bear with me. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Now originally, I'm born and raised in Chicago. What do you guys know about Chicago? <laughs> mean, windy, Cabrini Greens. Oh man, you took it to the mother of all. Okay, yeah, Chicago's a tough city to grow up in, nonetheless. Um, El Chapo Guzman was just arrested a couple of months ago. Um, he was public enemy number one um, in the city of Chicago, and that's pretty significant because we haven't had a 
public enemy number one in Chicago since the days of Al Capone and outfits. I know many of you probably know who Al Capone was. Um, did a lot of crime during prohibition, corruption. Um, made the drive-by shooting famous. I say that because Chicago has been a gangster city for a significant amount of time. I mean, even when we look at the first uh, research on gang studies, but uh, 2009, Darian Albert was killed in front of his school. I don't know if you guys saw that, but um, it was a YouTube sensation. They posted it on there, everybody viewed it. This kid was pummeled in front of his school. Um, 15, 16 guys beating them with bats and two by fours and different things like that. So I shared that so you could understand the context of the community in which I was raised. Not to give any credence to my negative uh, or poor decision making moving forward, just to help you understand the context. Um, when I was there a couple of years ago for my birthday, um, this young girl was killed. Uh, she was on her porch getting her hair twisted, about to take her first trip to Disneyland. That's the reality of growing up in Chicago. You just never know. You have to expect the unexpected. The south side of Chicago is a pretty tough place um, to grow. I'm the product of a strong mother and a weak father. And I say that because they both were teen parents. My mother was 16. My father was 15. Can you be a good teen parent? Is it possible? OK, it is possible. I don't know much about it, but I do watch the show Teen Mom. And I, I learned a lot from that. You know, I'm rooting for those girls. You know, I want those girls to win, but it's a struggle when you have a child at a young age. I do understand that. Um, but my mom was 16, my father was 15, and my mother was brilliant. Um, never received a B in high school. Valedictorian uh, gave the speech. Um, never received a B. And I just was mesmerized by the fact that she could do that, even though she gave birth to my sister at 16. And I came three years later. And then my brother came um, eight years after that. But my father, I say he was weak because um, he fell victim to the same battles that I fought. And that's the only reason I say that. I still love my father even though we have no relationship. My father was abusive. My father has been a heroin addict since I was a, a little kid. And it affected us. Um, you know, of course, when I was a kid, I didn't know about drugs. I didn't know what it was. But after his stints and rehabilitation, I started to become abreast of what heroin was. I didn't, man, for a seven, eight-year-old to be in places talking about heroin, it was beyond uh, my, my level of understanding. But um, my father struggled with it. But my father was abusive. That's why my mother wore dark glasses all of the time. Extremely abusive. The first time I saw a firearm was when my uncle was coming to shoot my father. And I had a number of mixed emotions around that. I wanted my father to, you know, um, be dealt with but, you know, it was my father. It was my dad. So it was tough. So I always grew up in this netherworld, not really fitting in anywhere. Like, you know, being accepted here and being accepted here, but never fully in either, either realm. So it was tough growing up. But because of that, I clung to my sister. I love my sister, man. Even to this day, just talked to her this morning. We have a pretty tight bond. And we needed to have that bond growing up um, in Chicago. But my sister is, um, is a champion. I'm glad I had a big sister like that or have a big sister like that. But um, she taught me things coming home from school. We played together. We did a lot of different things together. We wrote lyrics to songs. We did a lot of fun stuff as kids. But our upbringing was pretty traumatic just due to where we lived and um, due to what my father's um, behavior entailed. But when my father was on drugs, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know how he would behave. We didn't know how he would act. We wouldn't know if he would be nice, if he would be irritated. We didn't know. And it um, kind of threw, threw us off balance. It would be like, hey, OK, there's my dad, but what is he going to be like? Is he going to give me a hug? Is he going to shake my hand? Is he going to push me to the side? Never knew. So it was like I grew up in a tizzy. And I always loved my father, but my father decided to just leave us. And I think I'm still dealing with stuff from that. But my father just decided to leave when I was around 11 years old. And I couldn't understand it. Because it's like in a community where you rarely see dads, it was a blessing to have my father. Even though he wasn't the best, he wasn't the most, you know, stand-up type of guy, but it was my dad, and I saw him, and I knew him, and sometimes he would come to my school, and he dressed nice, and people was always like, man, you know, you got a cool dad, but when he left, I'm like, okay, what is that about? Because I felt like I was the son 
you know, that a father would want. You know, I played sports. You know, I, I was active in school, got good grades, stayed in gifted classes, you know, but I was always bad in school. So teachers would always say, man, you're so smart, but you're so bad, or vice versa. So I never really fit in, but I stayed in gifted classes throughout my entire elementary school because I could do the work effortlessly. But the behaviors, kindergarten, I was sent to the office, first grade, in kindergarten, I'll just give you this story, just so you can understand how I went into school with problems. I had a Batmobile. It was the kind you pull back, and when you let it go, it looked like it's going 100 miles an hour when you're a kid. A girl retrieved it and was bringing it back to me, and when she brought it to me, I just socked her in the eye. I'm a grown man. I still don't know why I did that. Still to this day, I, I have no idea of why I did that to that girl. She did nothing wrong and I punched her in the eye. That's the first time I went to the office. I was in kindergarten. After that, I kept going to the office, first grade, second grade. Second grade, I got my eye split, got stitches from a fight in the, um, in the playground. Third grade, trouble. Fifth grade, I forged my mother's signatures. My criminal activity began at a very early age, but my father leaving, um, it enhanced. Um, it went to a higher level. But with my father out of the picture, it left a void. And my mother understood what that void looked like. She understood that there was a correlation between uh, fatherlessness and gang activity. Because I have an uncle who's been incarcerated for the last 33, 34 years. So my mother understood what it's like not to have a father around. So she put me in all kind of programs. I don't even know where she came up with the, with the money, but um, she wanted to save me. So she put me in basketball. I'm the kid all the way over here. We took number one for the south side of Chicago. I was 11 years old, and it felt good to be a part of her team. It kind of helped me not think about my father, but now I have another guy in my life, which is my coach, and I really didn't want another man in my life. I was turned off by that. The pain from my father hurt so bad, I didn't want another guy in my life. I didn't want a mentor. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want any of that. I felt like you could keep that. I figured this stuff out on my own, but it felt good playing for this team. A year and a half after taking this um, photo, the guy all the way on the end, Terrence, who was our captain, was killed due to gang violence. That's the reality of Chicago. You could be on a, on a high from playing sports or doing things, but then you hear something like that and it kind of uh, puts a damper mood on what you guys accomplished together. But my ed education was interrupted when I reached eighth grade. Because of all of my other negative behaviors, when I reached eighth grade, my school just decided to kick me out. No particular reason. They said, nope, you're too bad. You're in eighth grade now. We got to just kick you out of the school. And that took a drastic turn on my life because I went to the same school from kindergarten through seventh grade. But now I'm being uprooted from the only school I know, the school I played basketball at, the school I had some of my best experiences. I was actually being removed from my comfort zone. And I went to a school that was on the other side of town, and there was a guy in my class named Kenneth Garrison. This kid was 16 years old in eighth grade, and he was a real bully. I mean, this kid had muscles and everything. This kid looked, I don't know, maybe he wasn't that muscular, but in my eyes at 13, this kid looked like the Incredible Hulk to me, man. I'm like, and he was a real bully. So I got into a fight with him reluctantly um, shortly after beginning at that school, and they were actually talking about sending me to another school. So I always felt like I was smart and could do things and could thrive, but on the other hand, I had negative behaviors that I couldn't explain, that I didn't know what to do with. So I was struggling. So a lot of the kids you might work with or a lot of people you, know, um, you seek to provide care for might be going through the same things. Show, exert a lot of challenging behaviors, but on the other hand, they're really good in other ways. And that's how I felt I was. Um, a lot of people might not have saw that, but I graduated from eighth grade. And if you know anything about an eighth grade graduation in Chicago, it's huge. It's like you graduated from college. I mean, it really is. Like any of you know about an eighth grade graduation in Chicago? Okay, <laughs> a few of you. It's significant because the social workers, the teachers, the community activists, they know very well that might be your last graduation. That's the sad reality of it. That might be your last graduation for whatever reason. So they celebrate, they roll out the red carpet for eighth grade graduation in Chicago. So I was grateful that I graduated from eighth grade, but I knew, my, I knew my work wasn't done. I went to the same school as Jennifer Hudson, Dunbar High School. Um, 
Dunbar produced a, a lot of great people. Um, how many of you know Mr. T? Some of you can go back there. Okay. <laughs> Mr. T, uh, he played football for Dunbar. But if you look in the background, you can see the project builders. When you see those tall buildings like that, it's a lot of negativity associated with it for, for whatever reason. But there's a lot of, there's a stigma associated to those projects and that Cabrini Greens and those kind of environments. This was Prairie Course behind my high school. You couldn't walk down that street after school. It wasn't even an option. You couldn't go down that way. Prairie Courts was dangerous. Dunbar was a dangerous high school to attend. But we produced a lot of lead leaders. Um, how many of you know who Lou Rawls is? I always get less for Lou Rawls, but um, he was also a prominent person who um, had prestige. But I went to Dunbar really to play basketball. I lettered in basketball. I was pretty good. And it was an honor to play for that basketball team. We had some great, great years there. Um, but Dunbar is a violent school. This happened um, in December. One of the basketball players was actually killed on the bus in front of the school. So you have to understand what that does to you. In 2008, a guy was killed in the parking lot who was a student. Uh, just this February, um, a Dunbar student who was a freshman was killed. Dunbar is a pretty violent school. Metal detectors, uh, gang violence, you know, there have been shootings. It's, it's pretty rough pretty rough going to Dunbar, but as I stated, I want to go there strictly to play ball. Um, some of you may know the story of Ben Wilson. How many of you are familiar with the Ben Wilson story? If you're not, you need to become familiar with it. Ben Wilson was the number one basketball player in the nation his senior year of high school. They said after you mentioned Michael Jordan and Oprah Winfrey, the next person you mentioned was Ben Wilson. This guy was significant, kind, courteous, a great guy. He was actually killed two blocks away from his school. Bumped into a guy, the guy pulled out a gun, shot him dead. I'm just trying to help you understand what I saw growing up, what I knew, what the stories were in my neighborhood. You, you can't, like, it's hard to dream and envision yourself doing things great when you hear all of this stuff, all of these statistics, all of this crime, when you're seeing things all the time. It's very difficult, so sometimes, you know, we get caught up in it. Thrasher conducted one of the first credible and reliable research studies on gangs. And this is what he found, and it's still prevalent today. He found that the gang offers the underprivileged boy probably his best opportunity to acquire status. That's pretty sad, isn't it? That in order for you to get status, your, your best option is to join a gang. This was a 1927 study. So you must understand that, because a lot of kids, you know, in, growing up in Chicago and other places, not just Chicago, we talk about Minneapolis, St. Paul, we talk about a lot of different places where kids are getting caught up in this because they think they um, have to be tough. You know, all those media images. And if you look at the work of Jackson Katz, it shows that a lot of boys are being raised to be tougher than what they really want to be, to be buff and to be all these different things. So growing up, a lot of people join the gang so that they can have that tough edge. My buddy growing up was Sherman. I had a lot of friends, but Sherman was one of those kids that could do everything. Um, you know, he did a lot of illegal things, but he was just good at a lot of things. He could flip, he can, you know, uh, you know, play a little ball. He, he, he was a jack of all traits, and he grew up in the foster care system. Um, Sherman, I remember being in fourth grade. We were walking down the hall. Somebody pulled the fire alarm, so we all had to evacuate. Sherman was behind me. He said, hold on, wait a second. You know, I'm like, okay, what? He lifted the fire alarm, the, the tool, he lifted it up and pulled it back down. Then he took his scarf and he wiped it off. I said, man, what are you doing, man? He said, oh, got to get rid of my fingerprints. I'm like, fingerprints? You know, I'm nine years old. I'm like, what? This kid was, this kid had a high level of criminal activity because I'm like, nobody, you know, back then, we didn't know about fingerprints. We didn't know, you know, wipe it off after you do something. We didn't know that. So Sherman was one of those kids. He was always had that criminal element. You know, you know, he knew how to get in the codes and get in the cars and all of these things. And um, I got weak and I went to Sherman and I said, Sherman, I need to make some money, man. And I still have a hard time, you know, talking about that because that was the decision that led to a number of poor decisions. But I said, Sherman, I need to make money. I was never asked or recruited by gangs or any of that. I went to Sherman. I said, I need to make some money. And he said, what you trying to do? I said, I'm just trying to sell something. He said, well, if you're going to be out here, you know, selling, you know, are you going to be comfortable with selling to your father? Now, at this point, I hadn't seen my father for maybe two and a half years. 
And I said, would I be comfortable selling to my father? He said, yeah, you know, he comes through here, you know, from time to time. And I'm thinking, man, if he, come, if he comes around, why don't, you know, why doesn't he just stop by the house? Like, so I said, yeah, man, don't want, you know, I got to keep my front for my friend. I got to save face, you know, like I'm not phased by it. But I'm like, what? I'm blown away. But I said, okay, don't worry about that. I'll be able to do it. And I got out there and I started selling drugs. I wasn't thinking about how, to, how I was tearing down my community. I was being really selfish at this time. And I felt really good about selling drugs. You know, I was able to buy things. Um, I was able to have a little girlfriend, you know, like things that are important to a young person. Um, I was able to provide that from doing it the illegal way. But Sherman said, okay, if you stay out here with us too long, you might have to join the gang. So I had in my mind, okay, I'm gonna stay out here for a little while, make whatever I need to make, and then I'm done with it. Sherman came to me after three weeks and said, hey, it's time for you to join the nation. And I said, Sherm, you know I'm not a gangbanger. I'll fight for me, I'll fight for my sister, but I'm not a gangbanger. He said, it's too late for that. So when I went to this first gang meeting, I realized that there were a lot of boys in there trying to convert to the gang version of manhood and trying to make money. And I, I was just realizing a lot of things. Everybody dreamed of having large cash. So they joined the gang as a, the gang was like a conduit to, to get all of these lavish things. So. I was learning a lot just from hanging with these guys. I wanted to just sell drugs, but I was noticing a lot of different things. A lot of them were vulnerable. A lot of them were falling through cracks. A lot of them shared a lot of similarities. So not saying they were bad people, but they got caught up in, in, in the um, just trying to make it in life. The leader of the gang was Jeff Ford, leader of the Blackstones. Uh, he's locked up doing 80 years right now in a conspiracy. He was caught with a rocket launcher pretty dangerous guy. Um, you could see an episode of Gangland if you want to know more about him, but everybody honored him. When he passed the message down from prison for us to do things or to send them money or to connect with other people, we did it. It was no questions asked. You know, and for me, I had no connection to him. I didn't know who he was, but when I went to this first gang meeting, I realized how structured they were. They had a, a, a chief, a prince, they had generals, they had a treasurer, they had a secretary. Like this thing was really structured and I was like, man, and it was like 400 to 500 members on his account. I go in there, I'm 14 years old joining this gang. There's a girl 15 years old who's leaving the gang. She's exiting, she's three months pregnant. But unfortunately she was pregnant by a rival gang member, which is a no-no in the gang culture. So she has to go into the circle and she has to get a two minute violation. Now, when you get in a violation, you can't fight back. You just have to take it or block or try to cover yourself up. She's three months pregnant. The two girls who had to administer this violation were 19 years old. And these weren't any ordinary girls. These were like weightlifting girls. I mean, like U.S. gold medal Olympics weightlifting girls. Like muscles out of the neck, just ready. They start punching this girl. And she was unconscious after the first minute. Just too many, too many punches, too many blows. And you can't fight back. You fight back, everybody's just going to start beating you up. I saw this. They start punching this girl, man. She's laid out unconscious after the first minute. All the leader kept saying was, beat that baby out of her. I still get chills when I say that. He was poised, unmoving. Beat that baby out of her. This isn't normal to me. My hands are sweaty, my knees are shaking. I felt like I was about to pass out. Like, I'm trying to act normal, but this, this is really not normal to me. My cousin was in there, he's looking at me, Sherman looking at me. A lot of people like, man, like, you all right? Because I'm looking like, man, this is crazy. But I guess, you know, they looked at it as if she was sleeping with the enemy, sharing secrets, doing things she shouldn't have done. They drug her body out, and they proceeded as if nothing ever had happened. This was like a depiction of what I saw at that time, and it was troubling for me. But I was there at this point, it was really, I felt like there was no way of turning back. After that, I was actually blessed into the gang. They knew me, and there are a number of different ways you can get into the gang, but I, I was credible as far as the neighborhood. They knew I would fight. They knew I, um, where I lived. They knew I didn't have to get jumped in or do any kind of initiation. Because if you think back to these years, if you wanted to be a gangster disciple, their initiation was this. They would follow you down the street, driving, going different places with their lights out. Once you flicked your lights to let them know that their lights were out, they would follow you to your destination and kill you. How many of you knew that? About show of hands. 
Okay, many of you know that. Can you imagine growing up around that? When you walking down the street and you see a car riding with its lights out, knowing what's about to happen? That's difficult. But this was my reality. They did this for like a four year time span, riding down the street with their lights out. And once you did it, they, they, they followed you and they killed you. Growing up in that is kind of tough. Like growing up seeing this all the time, it's not normal, but it affects you on some level. So for me, once I got in, I wanted to be a leader. I didn't want to be a foot soldier. I didn't want to follow people's lead. I wanted to be a leader. So I learned all the gang literature. Everything they provided, I read it. And my buddy Lance Williams actually wrote this book, and he's working on a book uh, right now for the Gangster Disciple. He's a great, great guy. But I wanted to learn everything. I was invited to the Boys in the Hood camp, top 100 basketball players in Chicago. So while I was involved in gang, I still thrived as a ball player. I, I still was active in school. My grades were okay, but I just, you know, I was affiliated with a gang. So it was like, I went to this camp of the top 100, and it was like a blessing. It's a blessing to even get invited. But all the Chicago Bulls were out there. They did these drills with us. They worked with us, and I felt like, man, coming from this camp, a week-long camp, I was going to be ranked in the city of Chicago. And it felt good in a city where everybody wants to play basketball. So I came back on fire. You know, it was like, man, I played against a lot of guys who went to the NBA. I came back thrilled. I'm like, yes, man, I'm about to get ranked. Because they kept talking about this kid named Kevin Garnett coming to Chicago. And I'm like, man, forget, forget that guy. Like, like forget him. I'm, I'm the one. And um, I wanted to compete, you know, I wanted, I was at that time, I felt like I had it. I felt like, hey, you know, maybe I will go to the NBA. That was my dream at that time from leaving that camp. But when I came back, at this point, you know, I'm smoking marijuana and I always told myself I wouldn't. But my sophomore year, I'm smoking marijuana, I'm drinking a little bit, and um, my buddies pick me up from the Greyhound. We drive to my buddy Larry's house. We over there, we smoke, and I'm telling them all about the tournament. Like, man, you know, I did this, I did that. You know, I had 28 points on Corey Maggette. You know, I had 30 points. You know, I'm pumped. Larry's phone rings. And we tricked each other all the time. So, you know, I didn't know if he was being honest or not. He said, hey, it's your mom. I said, man, it's not my mom, man. You're not going to trick me like that. He's like, no, really, take it. It's your mom. I'm like, okay. I say, hello. My mom says, Jason, come home. I said, Mom, what's up? Just, just talk to me. You know, what's up? You know, and I could talk like that with my mom because when I'm 16, my mom's 35. She's still pretty young. Like, we didn't have one of those, like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. It's like, you know, we're just going to talk flat out, you know. And um, I'm like, Mom, what's up? Just tell me. She said, Jason, just come home. I said, okay. I hung up that phone. I knew she found those drugs because my family, they don't even call me Jason. I have a, like, childhood nickname that's it's pretty embarrassing <laughs> you know to be a grown man with that nickname now but you know for her to say Jason come home I knew it was serious I said hey I gotta go I think my mother found those drugs I grabbed my backpack and I proceeded to walk home it was only three blocks but it felt like I was walking to the electric chair I swear it felt like man I was walking to Green Mile or something man I felt like this was the end I went in the house and my sister is over dramatic I walked in the house my sister zips past the door. You're in trouble. Eyes big. Pew! I said, okay, I'm, I'm here now. I go in the room. Everything is laid out. Drugs, scale, money, baggies, everything. And my mom, you know, she's five foot five. She's trying to look at me and try to keep her self together, but I see her fighting back tears. I broke my mom's heart with that. She didn't raise me to be a drug dealer. She didn't raise me to, you know, be a gangbang. If we didn't have it, it's not a big deal. You will get it. You know, just work at it and things like that. She wasn't like that, so she was heartbroken, fighting back those tears, looking at me like, what's going on? Like, I broke her heart, man. And like I said, it's still, it's still tough because my mom is a good mom. You know, I can say that. I have a great mom. And um, she just didn't raise me like that. So it was hard, you know you know, exposing her, her to that. You know, it's just really disrespectful as well. But she stayed on me after that. Are you gonna stop selling drugs? You know, are you gonna quit? You know, you know you shouldn't be selling drugs. Cut it out, you know, et cetera. It was going on and on. I walked in the house one day, my sister said, hey, don't go anywhere. My mom, you know, mom wants to speak with you. I'm like, okay, fine. I walk in, my mom is like, hey, you know, I'm gonna send you to Iowa so you can get better. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, Iowa? I'm like, you know, what's in Iowa? You know, and she like, because uh, the first thing came to my mind is like, I got to like become a farmer or, you know, got to milk cows and stuff. Like, you know, I'm a city boy. So when you say Iowa, I'm like, Iowa have no, 
have no kind of uh, parameter. I have no kind of idea of what Iowa would entail. I don't know what they do in Iowa. So um, I said, okay, fine. But she knew this basketball thing was serious. So I'm like, man, okay, I'll go down there for three weeks or whatever. No big deal. I come in the house again. My sister is like, hey, you're not just going to Iowa. You're moving to Iowa. Mama's getting your transcripts. And I'm like, transcripts? She's like, yeah, mama's at your school right now getting the transcripts. So you're going to move down there and finish high school. Taken aback from that. But I had to get the blessing from the game. Even though my mom wanted me to go to I still had to get the blessing from the game. I seen them drive eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours to go get people who just try to leave. I didn't want that. So I went to Sherman and a few others and said, hey, you know, I'm going to move to Iowa. You know, my mom, you know, found my drugs and she wants me to move. They said, you don't got to do that. We just bought the building. You can, you know, get a room right here in the building. I'm like, no, nah, man, this is my mom. You know, I'm going to go down there. And they said, okay, well, if you want to go down there, you have to get branded. So I actually had to get the gang tattoo placed on my arm in order to go to Iowa. If I didn't get that tattoo, I wouldn't have been able to go. Just as simple as that. And this was at a time when tattoos weren't even really popular. It was like, you, if you had a tattoo, it was a gang tattoo, or it said, love mom. That's it. If you, know, like, if you know somebody in Chicago, they will tell you this. Either it was a gang tattoo, or it said, love mom. That was it. And I don't even think they had tattoo guns back then. Like, you sat there and you got poked for the entire tattoo. So this was... This was what was happening at, at, at this point. I moved down to Iowa. I thought I was going to some nice suburb, but I went to Waterloo, Iowa. Any of you know about Waterloo, Iowa? Okay, a few people. Okay, represent. I like, hey, I like Waterloo now, but when I went there, it was gangs there. They had violence. They had trouble. And me walking in there, uh, they knew about my reputation coming from Chicago. I came just coming from Chicago had a reputation in and of itself. Without meeting me, without talking to me, just the fact that I was from Chicago raised awareness, was a red flag, because I'm coming from there. My first week of school, Principal Balderman pulled me to the side. Say, hey, you're Jason Soul. Come here, let me talk to you. And I'm like, man, this is weird. You know, I'm just starting school. He said, you know, I know you're here because you were in a gang and you got caught with drugs, but we want you to have a good start here. And I'm like, how do you even know that? He said, your aunt told us all about you, so she wanted us to really help you. I'm like, okay, fine. He said, I'm, this is my first year here from Chicago as well. You know, I was like, okay, cool. You know, this is the principal. You know, he like, man, from Chicago. So we had that Chicago uh, connection. But I went there and I thrived in a number of different realms. Um, I was invited to the Botillion Ball, but I had poor decision making. You, you get invited to the Bo Botillion Ball, it's pretty significant. These are people who are prominent. I don't even know how I got selected for it, to tell you the truth. I took somebody's slot because I didn't deserve it. This is for people who aren't in gangs, who don't get in trouble, who don't do drugs, and I was all the above. So they had to invite me strictly based on popularity because I played ball, I led my team down state, I set a track record. It had to be for athletics because I would have fights outside of school. Big fights, you know, fights, you know, after the basketball game, things like that. But they invited me for, to this, and you can see I don't have on a suit or a tie. I would just do stupid things. You know, I was a, I was a knucklehead, really. I didn't even show up for the event. This was televised and everything. I didn't even show up. I had a date in there and everything. I didn't even show up. I came to the event after it was over, and I was drunk and high with my friends. People were looking at me like, man, you're messing up. So I would make, I would sabotage myself on a number of levels. But as I stated, led my team downstate in basketball. So I had skills. I had leadership abilities. Just didn't know how to execute. But as I stated, I would do dumb things. This is for the newspaper. You see, I'm in there. I got my hat tilted to the left. A Chicago Bulls hat. That looks bad as far as newspaper, colleges. You know, like, it just looks bad. But my buddy J.J. Moses next to me, he knew what to do. Five foot four, he went to the NFL, played eight successful seasons. Right now, he's the ambassador for the Houston Texans. That guy knew what to do. You see, he's smiling in the paper. He, he had a father who played for the Green Bay Packers. His father raised him to be an athlete, to be articulate, to be certain things that I didn't have. And he's a motivational speaker, travels all over. He always says, you know, he had a stronger foundation, and that's why he's able to do what he did. I just didn't have that uh, foundation. As I stated, I'm just giving you a depiction, you know, like, as I stated, not to glamorize or glorify, but just to tell you the story. This is homecoming. I'm the guy in the back. If you can't see what I'm doing, I'm throwing up my gang. This was my life. This was my identity. So it was like, if you ask me about my gang, I will tell you. If you wanted to fight about it, I would fight you about it. This was everything to me, being in, in a gang and playing ball. But 
the gang thing was pretty significant. I wanted to be the homecoming king, so I lied about all of this stuff you see here. I lied about all of that. I mean, I played basketball, but I didn't do talent search or upward bound. I definitely wasn't on the prom committee. <laughs> that was, that, that, that's a lie. All of that's a lie. It even says, you know, he spent his summer in Chicago involved in an environmental group named Save the Planet. That's a huge lie. But the last line really strikes me. It says, his future plans are to attend college and major in law. I don't know where that came from because my senior year, I signed up for the military. I was enlisted in the Air Force my senior year. I didn't want to go back to Chicago. I didn't want to be involved in gangs. I felt like I go to the military, you know, I can get myself grounded, you know, have a successful life, you know, play ball. And the recruiter and I put all this in place where I could play ball. I would be stationed in a place where I could, you know, uh, play sports. But while I was in Chicago waiting for my date to fly out, they called me. And they said, hey, we need to run some tests on you. And I said, okay, where's this coming from? They said, did you have asthma as a kid? I had severe asthma to the age of 10. I said, yeah, I had asthma to the age of 10, but after that, you know, no problems, you know, um, as far as asthma. I grew out of it. And they said, well, we got to run tests on you. They took me two hours outside of Chicago, ran a number of tests, and a physician, physician said, you can't go to the military. Now, this is in August. My date to leave was like August 17th. And I said, why? And he said, you just have to contact your local physician. You know, they'll talk to you about it. So now I'm back at square one. I'm back in Chicago, no job, no prospects, nothing. And after that, man, I felt like, man, I'm done doing the right thing. I, I said, you know what? This is when I checked out, done doing that right stuff. I went to Iowa to get myself together. I signed up for the military to fight for my country. I'm like, you know what? Forget all that good boy stuff. Now I got really involved in the gang culture. So you see me here. This is how I was. You see, I got five braids in my hair. And that five-point star meant something to me. It meant love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. So that's what that five-point star meant, which are great principles. But when you add guns and drugs, everything gets tainted. But those principles were what I lived by. You can see the project buildings in the back. So when you saw me, and this is at a time where the crime rates were fluctuating. It was going down, going up. It was fluctuating. And I was in the midst of all of this. So when you saw me, this is what you saw. My hat tilted, a pistol on my waist, smoking marijuana. I was done trying that good boy stuff. I felt like, man, forget all of that good work a job, do it. I said, no, nah, that, that's not for me. I only show you these pictures so it's more clear. Because if, if I would have walked in here today without any of these pictures, you'd have been like, yeah, really, you were in a gang? Really? So I, I show the pictures just to bring home a strong illustration. You see me, I have on a shirt with the five-point star. Every time you saw me, I wanted you to know what I represented. I didn't even want you to have to ask every time you saw me. As I stated, man, during these years, there was crime happening. Things were going on in the city of Chicago. So this isn't at a time where it was quiet. This is at a time where it was really pronounced. I had a cousin who was the prince of a gang in Minneapolis. He came to Chicago and said, hey, man, you come to Minnesota, there's more money and less gang banging. I felt like that was a win-win compared to what I was doing in the city. I came down here, we got right back active to the things we did. Does this look like me? I'm healthy now. So, <laughs> you know, smoking all that marijuana and all that stuff, I was kind of uh, looked rough. You know, and that stress can take a young person and give you a, like, a old face. So it was like I was stressed at this time. I was going through things. I was, you know, involved in uh, crime, and I was doing a lot. But every time you saw me, it was gang-related. But with that life comes a lot of negativity. A lot of bad things happen, a lot of trauma. A lot of those aces that Rebecca talked about in the keynote. I was going through a lot of those things. And um, you know, I lost my best friend. And it's still tough talking about Doug, man, because Doug was a twin, and his twin was physically and mentally disabled, couldn't do anything, couldn't correspond with you in any kind of way. So I always was protective of Doug. It's like, man, you know, the fact that he's, he has this struggle, you know, I'm going to watch over him. But I couldn't save him. i never forget our last discussion. He was sitting on the couch, and I was standing up, and I was talking to him. And he said, man, you know, I'm leaving, man. I'm going back to Chicago and get the chief enforcer position. And I said, man, you don't need that, man. You know, of course, we, just lost, we had just lost one of our friends due to the hands of one of our other friends. So he like, man, you know what, it's too shady. I don't know, you know, who's trying to harm us or what. I'm leaving. And I said, okay, man. I said, and I feel like I could have talked him out of leaving. I, fe I feel it. And I still have regret 
behind this conversation. But um, I said, Doug, man, you stay here. Come on, man. We're going to work this out. We'll get through it. And he said, no, I want to get go to Chicago and get that position. He went down there. He had the chief enforcer position, which means he had to protect the neighborhood. Anybody try and come in, do harm to anybody in the community, he had to set up defense or whatever. And one day he told Reggie, hey, it's your turn to be on security. You got to watch the neighborhood. Reggie said, don't give me the gun. Reggie wasn't the kind of person to hold a firearm, which is understandable. But he pushed Reggie and gave him the gun. When he turned around, Reggie just shot him in the back with the gun he gave him. It was tough, but Doug fought through the night. You know, he, I talked to him. He like, man, I'm good, man. I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to come back to Minnesota after this. I said, okay, cool, man. I mean, this guy was, like, pumped when he talked to me. His sister was like, hey, man, Doug really want to talk to you. You know, he really need to talk to you. And I'm like, man, okay. And he was like, man, I'm, I'm good, Jay. I'm coming back. You know, I'm coming back down there. And his lung collapsed, and he died in the night. And it was sad because it wasn't just Doug. You know, he left a daughter behind. You see, her shirt says, I love you, Daddy. Sad funeral. The entire time, she said, Daddy, get up. Daddy, get up. The entire funeral. At his funeral in Chicago, Minneapolis police showed up there in uniform, six officers. They weren't disrespectful at all. They came in, they sat in the back, and they observed. I felt like I was under some kind of investigation at that point. I felt like they're watching me for something. And um, Doug's mom said, why don't you slow it down? Slow it down. I don't want to see you like my son is. Figure it out. I said, okay, fine. I came back to Minnesota, and you probably heard some of these things. It's been talked about. My story has been shared with a lot of people. I came back to Minnesota, and I squashed all of my interactions or all of my negative uh, issues I had with people. I had issues with bloods, crips, gangsters, disciples. I had issues with gangs out here, and I don't mean just words or just fighting. I mean, we were shooting at each other and things like that. So I had, like, a, a, a number of issues, and I went around to everybody, and I said, hey, I want to make a treaty. I want to call for peace, man. No gang activity, man. You see me, I see you. We just go, we say hi, and we keep going. And it seemed like everybody honored the treaty. I was riding down St. Paul, down in St. Paul on University Avenue. Any of you from St. Paul? I love St. Paul. I'm riding down the street on University. A car pulls up, and there's some Crips. And they shoot me up really bad. I got a rod and screws on my leg as a result. I got shot with a 40 caliber. And after that, I was turned off to the world, man. After that, I said, you know what, man? I tried to make peace. I tried to do the right thing. Once again, everybody knows. If you know any, like, St. Paul police officer, Minneapolis, they'll tell you. I went around, and I tried to make good with all these gangs. And I didn't have to do that. And then they shot me up, and I said, okay, see, trying this good stuff is not working for me. Like, it's just not working. They shot me up pretty bad. They were going around saying they killed me. And after that, I just got worse. Now, you better not say this looked like me. Like, for real. Like, it's something about that Polaroid. They know how to put something in there. I look at celebrities who go to jail and stuff, and it's like the pictures are always worse, like terrible photos. But I was a frequent flyer. I kept getting incarcerated. Different, different reasons. Fights in the club. Um, when I was arrested here, um, I was arrested for terroristic threats. And I didn't even know what terroristic threats were. Nobody around me was arrested for terroristic threats. And this was before 9-11. So I'm like, terroristic threats, and I was afraid. They're like, yeah, we got you. You know, we're we, we taking you down now. And I'm like, okay, man, I'm scared, you know, because I'm thinking it's a federal case, and it's going to be huge. And they put me in the car. Because I thought terroristic threats was like something against the president. You know, so it's like, when I was getting in the back of the police car, I was really thinking to myself, and I was so high and drunk at the time. I was in the back seat of the police car thinking to myself, what did I do to the president? <laughs> Like, like, I really was, like, trying to think, like, man, what did I do to the president? The whole ride. Because they took me to a library. They took me to a gymnasium. And I guess people were identifying me. But I realized it was just an issue where I had, um, was talking, uh, you know, crazy to a guy. He was talking the same stuff to me. So I didn't think he would call the police because we both said things. But um, it was actually reduced to disorderly conduct. But I kept going to jail for, for drugs, for fights for a lot of different things, man. It was a tough time in my life, but, um, you know, I, I was out here living this life, and I really didn't even know how I ended up in this place. I really didn't. I don't know how I ended up to be that kind of person, but one of my incarcerations led to me being locked up for 40 months. Um, and while I was incarcerated, I was a gang leader. You know, I was in there with lifers. I was fighting, solitary confinement. Um, 
And I just had the whole prison experience. I sold drugs while I was in prison, mainly in Fairboat. Um, had good rapport with some guards, and one guard, Ephraim Monado, this guy said, man, you more than a gang leader, man. He started planting seeds. He said, you're more than a gang leader. And I don't even know why he said that, because I had just gotten in trouble. You know, somebody broke into the vending machine and took all of the snacks and all of the, all of the money out, and somehow my name just kept coming up. And, and, and I, I'm like, man, I'm not a thief. You know, I may have done a lot of things, but I'm not a thief, man. I might have sold drugs and stuff, but, you know, I'm not a thief. And they were on me. All the guards were like, no, you're in trouble now, you know, or whatever. And Ephraim always saw the good in me. He always said, you know, you're going to be okay, man. Think about it. I got out, got a job at the Holiday Inn, setting up banquets like this, you know, putting things in place for people. And, you know, I was doing weddings, and I became the supervisor in three months. You know, I actually got a job. I landed my job in five days after being released, after doing 26 months, which is pretty significant because it's hard to get a job with felonies on your record. But I knew I could do more. During this time, I'm working at the Holiday Inn, Hazelden decided to do a documentary on my life. They captured every step of the way. Me trying to put my friends to the side, me trying to do better, me trying to go a different route, which was tough because I loved my friends, and the film has been effective. They show it all over, and um, it's producing a lot of great results, but I decided I needed more education. I, I decided I needed to go to college, and I felt like I couldn't make it in college, but I said, you know, hey, I'll give it a shot. Went in Metro State, got signed up, met Professor Sam Grant. And if it wasn't for Professor Sam Grant, I'd probably be under the ground, truthfully, because I still was fighting, still dabbling between worlds, still getting into a lot of things that I shouldn't have been. And he taught me what friendship was. And my circle changed. Like, he connected me to people who I wouldn't have necessarily had friendships with. These people were extremely lame to me. I mean, really. Not saying it in a bad way, but they were like, my buddy Karen Monahan, she works for the Sierra Club, travels to D.C. a lot, does a lot of great work. Man, she would be like planting gardens and stuff. And I'm like, man, that is so lame <laughs> compared to my life. Like, I'm like, man, you are so square. Siobhan Johnson, she's the dean of students at St. Case now. Uh, she's very spiritual, very poetic, did spoken word. I thought that was lame too. You know, I'm like, all of this stuff y'all do is lame. But they showed me another way to live. They showed me a different way. Jose Thurman, he works for the House of Charity, working with people with chemical dependency. And my circle changed. So I started being around congressmen. This is Congressman Keith Ellison. He sent me this picture a long time ago. This is maybe close to 10 years ago now. And he just told me to strive. He wanted me to keep going. I needed that encouragement. So I started doing panels on consciousness, on Sigmund Freud, on Kant, Weber. I, st I found myself really becoming a student. And I felt like, man, I really can do more. I started working with kids. And for some reason, people didn't want me to work with kids. I don't know why. I don't know if they, I don't know if they thought I was going like, to teach them to be drug dealers or how to load a gun or, or what. But I had a passion for helping kids, and I was pretty good at it. And I graduated. I got a four-year degree in three years. I worked harder than everybody. I won male student leader of the year two years in a row, was a student worker. I worked there when I worked, with, worked at R.S. Eden. And I showed people that I had more to give in life. And it was like graduating from there was was awesome. I got my degree in criminal justice because I figured I might as well get credit for what I already know. <laughs> you know, I knew, I, knew about, I knew about jail, I knew about bail, I knew about arrest, cops, you know, so I figured I'd go that route. But it was tough because some of my professors were people who tried to incarcerate me when I was, you know, doing wrong. Like Chief Harrington, I had him for a gangs course. And it's like he knew me when I was highly involved in gangs. But you think I'm not going to get an A in a gangs course? Yeah, right. But it was a struggle, but I made it. I started working for Amicus, helping people coming out of prison. And my everything started coming together. I met Paul Schnell, police chief of Maplewood. I was doing trainings for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. And he said, hey, I want to co-train with you. And I said, man, I don't work with cops. You know, I'm sorry. I just don't work with cops. He said, I'm a good cop. I'm big on restorative justice. I know your past, but I see the potential in you. And I said, man, I just don't work with cops, man. And he said, no, give me a shot, and I'm going to elevate you to a higher, higher playing field. And he did it. I mean, we started rolling out those trainings, and we reduced the, the recidivism rate among sex offenders throughout the state of Minnesota by 76%.
from what we did. It's called MENCOSA. Grant Dewey did our research and it's been effective. We showed people how to work with a sex offender for an entire year to help them not reoffend, and it was successful. I have, you know, I have a bias against sex offenders that I'm trying to work on in understanding. So it was tough rolling out this model with my biases, but it was successful. And Paul would always say things like, you gotta make things right. You gotta make things right. He had a lot of catchphrases that he would say. Cause I had a girlfriend at the time and I felt like I do want to do the right things, but I was a little scared, hesitant, and things like that. But, you know, I felt like, man, I'm going to do the right thing. So I put a ring on it. <laughs> I felt like, man, I love her enough, man. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm, I'm going to marry her. And it was a great wedding, and we have great children, you know. And I'm actually the father I wish I had, man. You know, I really am, man. My daughters are everything. Today, you know, is actually my daughter's birthday. She turned seven today, and it's like, you know, we had a party in Chicago this weekend. She got another party coming up at the Mall of America Sunday. So it's like, we're going to do it big, and I hate I'm not there for it, but my daughter knows I love her. I called her this morning and told her, you know, I'm there every step of the way. So I do things like this. You know, I do t-ball with them. I do ballet. Well, I don't do ballet, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I do all of that stuff. I do swimming with them, and I'm there every, like I say, I love my children, man. Like, I don't care what kind of accolades I receive moving forward, as long as I remember as a great father. I'm gonna do what I need to do. You know, I, I write, you know, I, you know, publish my book. I'm working on a capital punishment study that I did amongst students. So I'm busy, but when I need to put my work to the side, I do it for my kids. This is my most important job and I'm not gonna fail at that. I don't care what kind of baggage I brought. I'm not gonna fail at this. I travel all across the country. When I was working on the Centoya Brown case in Tennessee, I was able to bring my, my kid to where uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it's important that I take them with me when I can because I want them to be connected. I even do square stuff like this. This is extreme. <laughs> I don't even like Halloween. I'm a grown man. Like, why would I like Halloween? But I do it, I do it for my kids. You know, I do it because I love them. Yeah, that's extremely lame, you know, but I do it because it keeps us tight. When my wife tells me I got to throw on some clothes and we taking pictures, that's what we doing. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to, you know, fall, you know, in, in that category because it's important. I have my master's. I'm about maybe a couple months from finishing my PhD, just editing, just doing editing work. So my, my life has changed and I'm grateful to even be able to talk about this stuff from the free world because it could have turned out much different. I train in Florida, I'm at the Capitol working on legislation, I work with the Council on Crime and Justice, I work with a number of different agencies, and it's great. So my circle has changed now. That was Julian Bond, this is me with Dr. Jawanza Kanjufa, who has written over 34 books about different plights. And as you can see, I have on, on a Malcolm X shirt. Uh, a lot of people think about him for his religious beliefs or his political views, but a lot of people fail to remember, he did seven and a half years in prison and came out to be a world leader. That's significant for a person like me. Also, you know, it's not as significant as Mandela doing 27 years in prison and going from prisoner to president, but it's pretty impressive. And I needed that to know what I could strive for. I'll never be president, but, you know, it's good to dream and try to strive for better. I work with Marion Wright Edelman on the school to prison pipeline. We'll be doing some work in June in Tennessee on, on how to stop that. This is me with Donna Brazil. So my life has changed and my circle has changed and I'm grateful to be able to share this. So this is my struggle now. Ruyar Kipling stated this. You gotta be able to walk with the crowd but keep your virtue. Or be able to walk with kings but not lose the common touch. That's my struggle now. I'm the most humblest person you'll ever meet. My struggle has given me a perspective. I don't care if you're the head of the office or if you clean the office. You get the same respect from me. I don't care if you're young, old, I treat everybody as best as I can. So while my, you know, on paper I look bad, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I want to strive to show you some kids are going through things, but they're good people, and they can go far if we give them a chance to. So I wanted to share that with you guys, man. Hopefully you can, you know, uh, see, the, see the benefit of me giving a pr presentation of that magnitude, but I just wanted to share, share that with you. And I make myself extremely vulnerable when I do this, but that's why you don't have it as a um, PowerPoint. That's why you don't have handouts because it's extremely personal to show my kids and show my life because I don't know if they'll be affected by my wrong decision making. And that's what I fear the most, that my kids will be judged based on a father who done so much wrong. So that's my struggle these days, but I just want to share that with you and I'm gonna transition so Rebecca can take the stage. I know you might have questions, Please hold them. If you see me, I, I answer anything. Nothing's too personal, but I just wanted to give you that so you can have it and understand it. Thank you. That is a ridiculously tough act to follow. I feel like the square person should have gone first. 
we were trying to give me a break, and now I'm thinking, oh, more square. Um, okay, Carrie has asked if I would ask you to quickly fill out your surveys and uh, push them to the side, to the aisles. So, Jason, you should have two survey forms, correct? So if you could send them to the aisles. The big one. Yes? If you, yep, it's a full sheet of paper for Jason. Thank you. Okay, so we will dive in given um, we've got about 45 minutes. Uh, my goal for our time today is to thread through, Jason does an incredible job of talking about his life story and what I wanna do is help transition us to think about a couple of different interventions um, or programs that might target different developmental periods when we think about kids who are impacted by incarceration. I suspect most of you are at the keynote this morning, um, but I just want to reflect very briefly on a couple of key points from that from this morning. So as I mentioned, um, in 2007, the Bureau of Justice Statistics reports said that there were 1.75 million kids with a parent currently incarcerated. I realized after I walk out, I forgot to tell you that among African American kids, that number is 1 in 15 with a parent currently incarcerated. Doesn't include the number of kids whose parents are currently in jail or on probation or parole. Um, and I mentioned this morning this really key piece about developmental considerations. Thinking about what kids need when they're impacted by this issue um, at different stages in their development. And so what I'd like to do here is just briefly reflect on three different developmental periods and think about what do we know that kids need um, in each of these windows. So we'll think about uh, infants and early childhood stuff, uh, middle childhood, and then some reflections on adolescence. And throughout each of these kind of snippets, I'm gonna share with you um, a couple of highlights from the work that we're doing. So when we think about babies, a lot of my work, I mentioned I do some work at the Shakopee Women's Prison. A lot of my work there is actually with pregnant women. And a lot of people will scratch their head and say, how many pregnant women are there in prison? You'd be surprised. Uh, national estimates suggest that 6 to 10% of women enter correctional facilities pregnant. I recently heard the uh, warden at Shakopee say that on any given day, 10 to 15% of their prison population is somewhere in the cycle of their pregnancy. So they may have just come in or they're nine months pregnant, but 10 to 15% of the, the women's prison population at some point in their pregnancy. No surprise then, right, that pregnant women are particularly vulnerable when we think about um, pregnant women in prison. We can think about all of the context of pregnancy that might uh, complicate things here. So poverty, extreme stress, exposure to violence, that might be domestic, sexual, or gender-based violence, um, lots of emergency and conflict situations, chaotic environments um, that, women, that pregnant women are in prior to their coming to prison. And we know that pregnant women, when we think about kind of maternal incarceration, it confers additional risk for, for their infants, for their uh, fetuses. So during pregnancy, we know that women who are exposed to toxic stress or extreme stress, um, they're less likely to eat, they're less likely to sleep well, they may fail to have adequate weight gain. And so we take a woman who is at particularly high risk prior to coming to prison, and we put her in this environment, and now there are lots of additional stresses that may compound this situation, right? We know that in most states, including Minnesota, incarceration results in the separation of the mom from her baby. This afternoon, you'll watch the film Mothers of Bedford, a compelling story about a state in which that's not the case, and some alternatives to incarceration when we think about the impact of separating moms and babies. At the Shakopee Women's Prison, we were seeing a number of challenges, particularly for pregnant women. Um, my colleague Erica Garrity would say she was a licensed, she is a licensed and clinical social worker and was doing her internship there and she said the pregnant women seem to be the saddest and the loneliest women in the facility. Just saying a lot if for those of you who have ever been inside a correctional facility to think about a group that's even sadder and more vulnerable than the next woman. Um, and out of that experience, out of her clinical internship, was born ISIS Rising. ISIS Rising is a program of Everyday Miracles, a nonprofit organization that helps protect and um, provide services for pregnant women um, with low-income 
pregnant women who are in low income situations. There was actually just now here in Duluth, uh, they've expanded Everyday Miracles, and so there's actually an office here in Duluth. ICE is rising. Um, the goals of the program are to increase women's knowledge about reproductive health and the physiology of pregnancy and childbirth, increasing women's tangible resources and parenting skills, and to increase women's support from peers and the professional staff at the women's prison. We have two components of our prison doula project. The first is a prenatal and parenting education. So we meet weekly with all of the pregnant women in the facility and provide a social support group, an opportunity to talk about an educational component, what to expect um, when their water breaks, but all, everything from that to how do you write a letter to your kid? What are some strategies that you might use to connect with your, your unborn child now, but also the children that you've left behind? And in that setting, women have the opportunity to share strategies with each other. You know, I start coloring a picture and I send it to my kid, and my kid finishes the picture and they send it back, and that's what's in my cell. Um, those groups offer us this incredible opportunity to create a warm and nurturing space in an environment that is hardly warm and nurturing, model empathy, encourage accountability, help women in that setting understand what's on them and what's on the CEO or what's on the system or what's on their mom, right? What are they responsible for and what can they control? We explain and uh, model empowerment and we support active and open communication, not just with the women in the group, but with their caregivers, with their children, and with the professional staff at the prison. In addition to the prenatal um, and parenting education component, we provide pregnant women with a doula. So a doula refers to a trained and experienced professional who provides continuous physical, emotional, and informational support to the mother before, during, and after birth. Um, we know that continuous doula support in the science, not with incarcerated women, but the research has shown that doula support results in shorter labors with fewer complications, the babies are healthier, and breastfeeding is more easily established. And so we knew that in the general population, women who have doulas have better pregnancies and better deliveries. And Erica thought, we can do this with incarcerated women. We can make this happen with incarcerated women. Um, and so we did. And over the last several years, we've been providing um, pregnancy and prenatal support to all of the women at the Shakopee Women's Prison. And I want to show you a brief clip that was recently done by Care 11 and sort of summarizes our program before I dive into some of our evaluation. The dichotomy of childbirth is the only way to explain happiness born of such pain. Okay, big, big breath to it. One more time. Hard times are not new to inmate 234961. I imagine I was going to be uh, in prison or jail when I had my child. We first met Cassie Bolio in her cell at Shakopee State Prison two weeks before her baby was due. I found out the first day I got, I got here. The intake pregnancy test was mandatory. It followed Cassie's conviction for stealing two televisions from the Little Falls Walmart and leading police on a high-speed chase, her second trip to Shakopee. All my crimes have been related to um, drug use. Tougher drug sentences are a principal reason the population has exploded at Minnesota's sole state prison for women. From 85 inmates at the prison's opening 27 years ago to 657 today. Six out of ten are back out within two years of arriving. And currently, so let's get started. 14 of them are pregnant. And how far along are you? Um, four and a half months. Until four years ago, they were, for the most part, on their own. I guess it seemed wrong to me. Erica Garrity was a graduate school intern at the prison who returned with a plan. It shows some diagrams of what your body looks like. Weekly prenatal education. Breathe. And support from the other expectant moms. It's Kara. Was just the start. Can I come in? Prison rules prohibit Cassie from having family present at the hospital for any part of her baby's birth. Oh, good. Just two corrections officers and the medical team. And now, that woman in the ponytail. So are you feeling that back pain all the time? Kara Kreutziger, Cassie's Doula. Long, slow breaths. I'll breathe with you. 
If the notion of a doula, a birth coach, is already raising your ire as a prime example of coddling inmates. I wish we could fast forward this part. Take a breath yourself. And breathe it out. And listen. The point is, it is benefiting us all. Erica's privately funded doula program, okay. called Isis Rising, has tracked 40 inmates' births. In 2010, the year before inmates were routinely assigned a doula, 11 babies were delivered, seven of them by costly C-sections paid for with tax dollars. Women would tell each other in the prison, well, if you get a C-section, you get one more day with your baby in the hospital. I don't like this. I don't really either. But with doulas now offering support and education. You want to go back? The number of C-sections for the next 29 births? One. We're talking about a 3% C-section rate. The national average C-section rate is about 30%. The hours pass, and Cassie's pain builds. Corrections officers come and go, not allowed by prison policy to offer even an empathetic touch, but Kara can. Cassie was 14 years old when her mother was killed in a car crash. Beautiful, look Cassie. Now she knows what it feels like to be the mother of a daughter, too. Look at how cute. I'm a proud doula. <laughs> she did wonderfully. We want to support that happening. Lori Timlin. The prison's parenting coordinator. Eight pounds, nine ounces. Believes society benefits when inmates have support before and during their births. I think about these kids who are being born who deserve to have a healthy mom during pregnancy. But there are limits. Prison policy prohibits the restraining of pregnant inmates. That status for Cassie has now changed. Big. She'll be allowed to bond with her daughter, Zariah, for 48 hours. I don't want to think about that part yet. It's the, the day that I don't look forward to. None of us do. It's the day we dread. Baby. For two days, Cassie has barely put her daughter down. Wanted her with me the whole time. Now her time is up. A young woman makes bad choices. A debt must be paid. Officers are tasked with a duty. And an increasingly familiar ritual is in play. The baby will be wheeled down the hall where Cassie's aunt is waiting to take her home. Cassie is not allowed to meet or even see her aunt. She will spend the next few days in her cell, crying. I think about her a lot while she's there. <sighs> Hello. But a few evenings later... Oh my gosh, look at her hair. Cassie will not be alone. There's a poem on the back from us. Cassie's release will come sooner than most. She's just waiting for me to come home. 16 days from this meeting. I'm okay now. Nearly all the pregnant inmates at Shakopee will eventually go home to their babies. The hope at the prison is that better births will make better moms and maybe even better citizens too. You will have a doula, you'll have someone there. Boyd Hooper, Care 11 News. Shakopee. Okay, so as the, that's a tough clip to follow. I've watched it a number of times and still find pieces that are hard for me. Um, as the research director of ISIS Rising, I get the privilege to keep all of the stats and follow the progress of our program um, and want to share with you a little bit about what we know about the outcomes of this. So at the 12-week follow-up for our group-based support, um, women reported significantly fewer depressive symptoms. They rate themselves as having more confidence as parents. They report having more support from other women at the prison. And they report more support from prison staff. This is the last part that I think is most compelling. Um, I think it's 
intriguing that we can model empowerment and accountability in that setting. And while our staff are not prison staff, simply by being in a group and sharing strategies by which they can um, responsibly and maturely approach the prison with their concerns, but also advocate for themselves, that they report having better relationships with the correctional officers and the staff there. One woman said, when we asked her what she learned from the group, she said, how to relieve stress, discipline my children, get support, ask for help, care for my children emotionally and physically. Um, in that clip, we also talked about some of the birth outcomes. So the C-section rate going from 63% in the first year to 3% uh, in the last two years, which is remarkable to us and something that we're still amazed by every single day. So between October 2011 and October 2013, we had 29 births. 28 of those were spontaneous vaginal deliveries and one of them was a planned C-section. No emergency C-sections, none that we um, were expecting. None of the babies were born preterm. None of the babies were born low birth weight. One woman said, having a doula there made my experience a good one. It helped a lot. You have to find something positive about your birth experience while you're in prison. My doula helped me achieve that. When we think about our birth outcomes for ISIS Rising, you know, why do birth mat outcomes matter for us as a program? Why do they matter for you as taxpayers and citizens and individuals who are working um, with this population in a variety of different ways? Um, we know that poor birth outcomes are related to higher health care costs. The average cost between a full term and a preterm delivery is $50,000. We pay for that as taxpayers, right? And so one of the things when they were shooting the CARE 11 story that we kept getting asked was, you know, this feels soft on crime. You're giving this woman something that she doesn't deserve. And if, you, if one feels that way, I can understand that perspective. And at the same time, at the end of the day, it behooves us all to have lower health care costs, healthier babies, healthier children, healthier schools, and healthier communities. Um, and so I think that's an important perspective to remember in all of this. When I think about recommendations for practitioners um, in this developmental window before we move on to the next one, thinking about ways to promote maternal mental health during the prenatal period, and I hope that if those of you who are going to stick around for the film next will really think about how do we do this, how does Mothers of Bedford do this, um, promoting mental health during that prenatal period supporting maternal child bonding in whatever way that looks like. So in the prison doula program, as you heard there, moms get 48 hours with their babies or 72 hours if they've had a C-section, the standard time that any mom would be at a hospital. How do we help moms recognize that while that time is short, it can be powerful and great for moms and great for babies? Um, thinking about identifying ways to have alternatives to mother-child separation. Cassie was going to get out in 16 days. I'd encourage us to think as a state about what the alternatives to incarceration are for a woman who's getting out of prison in 16 days besides being separated from her baby. I think that you'll see in Mothers of Bedford that there are lots of alternatives to incarceration and that there are several states that have prison nurseries um, or halfway houses that allow women to stay with their babies, get the support they need, have wraparound services, and again, have healthier moms and healthier babies. Thinking about providing mental health services during the postpartum period. Obviously, being separated from one's infant and returning to an isolating environment can be very hard, which is why in our prison doula program, we really try to make that next group a, a powerful moment where we can provide lots of social support for that, for that woman. Um, but there are other ways that this could happen too, right? Whether they be social support groups or letter writing or things like that that would help provide some support during this really critical postpartum period because we know that postpartum depression is a real and serious thing and that it can come with postpartum psychoses and women can really um, go down a, a bad path quickly following the birth of a child. Um, really important to establish consistency and stability in the infant's caregiving environments. I think about for those of you who are working in early childhood, what is that environment? Who's providing care for that child? And how can they really help maintain a lot of consistency where the baby is, when the baby will see mom, and put some stability in place? All babies need consistency and stability. We know that. How, in this circumstance, can we really help promote that? Identify opportunities to maintain the maternal-infant relationship. One of the first groups that I was in at Shakopee um, 
I was, they were passing around kind of a board book or a, a you know, like a, a Shutterfly book, the photo books that are made. And this mom, her boyfriend's, it was the paternal mother who was providing care for the kids. Um, and every month she took photos of that baby and sent a Shutterfly book to that mom in the facility. She watched everything happen from a distance. She saw that baby eat her first bite of whole food. She saw her baby sleeping. She saw her baby you know, take first steps. All of those moments that she would have otherwise missed that she was able to see because there was a caregiver who was willing to put in that effort and maintain that connection. All right, so we'll switch gears now and think a little bit about early childhood development. Um, what do we know about kids who are in this period of time? Thinking about what we know is that approximately a third of children with incarcerated parents are between the ages of five and nine years old. And you've got your Sesame Street kits here, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, we know, of course, as I mentioned with infants, the same is true for kids in this developmental period. Consistency and stability in the caregiver-child relationship are of critical importance. Not just because then those kids have stable home environments, right, but because then they're not moving schools and moving neighborhoods and moving friendship groups. So that's really important. We also know that this is a rich time of the development of self and emotion regulation, helping identify how am I feeling, how are you feeling, I feel this way now, but I'm going to feel this way in five minutes. I can be sad and angry, right? And when you think about that in the context of incarceration, one of the things that's really important during this developmental window is helping kids identify their emotions and effectively and sensitively responding to those emotions, recognizing that that kid is equally able to say, well, I'm really pissed off at my mom for not being here, or I'm really sad that, I've, that my mom's missing my first ballet concert, right? Or I wish dad could be at this basketball game. And Jason talks a little bit about the things that his father missed and his feelings of confusion about that. And so one of the important pieces during this developmental window, right, is the identify, being able to identify and regulate those emotions. And of course, huge advances in language and literacy skills. And so playing on this, recognizing the developmental window with which they're typically working, Sesame Street set out to respond to the needs of kids with incarcerated parents. Um, I often get a question about why would Sesame Street do this? What's, wh why do they care? Um, for many of you who have watched children's television program for, programming for a long time, you know that more recently they've been tackling incredibly tough issues. They tackled divorce, they tackled deployment, they've tackled hunger and food insecurity. And what they were finding was that many, having done their deployment initiative, many of the soldiers who were returning home to families were struggling with some of the same issues as incarceration. They were having a hard time getting jobs. They were having a hard time getting stable housing. They had lots of undiagnosed mental and chemical health issues. And where did they end up? In jail. And so when Sesame got a hold of this issue, they realized just how big the problem was. And they set out to tackle it. And so what they developed was multimedia resource kits that includes a Sesame Street DVD with a series of clips, some of which you saw this morning at the keynote, a guide for parents and caregivers, which really highlights some of those key pieces in this developmental window, right, about recognizing emotion, effectively responding to those emotions, setting routines and consistency, because we know that that helps with self-regulation in this developmental period. There's also a one-page uh, guide for incarcerated parents, which Carrie mentioned is in the back of the room if you'd like to see that. And then a whole series of web-related tools um, with a Sesame Street incarceration app. Um, while I suspect that some of you in this room have seen this, I want to show a brief clip that does all the highlights from the Sesame Street resources, because I think it is a nice summary of what this initiative is all about. <laughs> Little children? Big challenges. Incarceration. Alex, Alex, are you okay? Um, you seem kind of sad. Mm -hmm. Listen, Alex, whatever it is that's on your mind, you don't have to tell us. But we're your friends, and you can always talk to us if you want. It's just all this talk about my dad and where he is. Got me really upset. Oh, because your daddy's away? Uh, and you miss him? Yeah, but because of where he is, too. My dad is... 
My dad's in jail. In jail? Why? I don't like to talk about it. Most people don't understand. Actually, I do understand what you're going through. When I was about your age, my dad was incarcerated too. He was? Wait, um, what's carcerated? And why was your dad in it? Incarcerated is when someone breaks the law, a, a grown-up rule, and then they have to go to jail or prison. And your dad was in, uh, um, incarcerated? Yes, he was in prison. So I know how hard it can be, Alex. Yeah, it is hard. You're not alone. I've been Many are like you. Mom writes me letters almost every day, and Dad leaves them in my room to read when I get home from school. I love getting letters from her. It makes me feel close to her. I miss her a lot. Daddy says how proud he is of us for helping Mom at home and for all the things we're learning. It's hard not to be able to touch or hug each other, but Daddy blows me a kiss. I tell him I'll save it for later. Before we know it, it's time to go already. I don't want to say goodbye. I wish Daddy could come with us, but this is where he has to be because he broke a law. But we all look forward to the next time we can come and visit again. Yeah, I was surprised with a few of the questions that the kids had for me. Does mommy still love us? And I was definitely surprised that they would even ask such a question because of course, you know, Tiffany still loves them and thinks about them. Sometimes they'll ask over and over and over, but it's because they want to hear it over and over and over. How long have you and your mom been apart? A few years. A few a years. years. What's hard about it? Like, what's the hardest part of it? Um. You know, when I'm traveling and then I see children with their mothers and playing and everything. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how it feels to be like that. Look around and you'll see People who take care of you Who've lived it and will share with you Who always will be there for you <laughs> Like me So that's in your kits. I feel like we should have given you kits and Kleenex. Sorry. Um, so when I think about recommendations for practitioners in this developmental period, and those of you who may or may not be using the Sesame Street kits or working with, this, with kids in this developmental window, um, the first is, of course, to respond sensi sensitively to children's emotional reactions. Maybe you're a school social worker. Maybe that Monday morning happens and this kid is acting out and, you know, knocking stuff off his desk. Why might that be? Was there a visit Saturday? How can we sensitively respond to that kid's emotions and recognize that he might be angry or using that environment to say, I need somebody to help me out here, right? I, I need somebody to provide some support for me in this very difficult period. Um, supporting caregivers through difficult conversations, and I think the Sesame Street Resources does a really nice job of thinking about how can caregivers have these conversations about a really difficult topic. There's been really good evidence to show that caregivers, and I mentioned this this morning in the keynote, that caregivers will routinely lie about where the parent is. They might say dad's, at, you know, dad's at work or dad's at college, mom's on vacation in Florida, she'll be back in a few months. Um, when in fact the child, uh, you know, n may know or have inklings from other caregivers or other people in their life that the parent is incarcerated. And so it's very common that caregivers, again, with pretty good intentions, uh, provide 
children with inaccurate information about this. What the science has actually shown, though, is that when you ask kids separately from their caregivers, not about, you know, where is your parent, but kids will actually say, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I know my mom's in jail. Um, or I was doing a study once when I was in Wisconsin for some mentoring, uh, a mentoring program, and the caregiver told me, you know, make sure you don't say anything about jail or prison. He has no idea. And the teenager says to me, I talk to my mom like once a week. I, don't, I go down to my aunt's house and we call her, or she calls. So this kid was talking regularly to his mom, and his grandmother had no idea or thought, you know, she said she had no idea, and she thought he had no idea. And it was this eye-opening experience, right, about uh, family and honesty, and the, the idea was to protect this child from her worry, right, about the real worries about stigma and shame and embarrassment that if he knew, but he was actually keeping his own secret. And so there was a lot going on in that family that made it really, um, really difficult. Um, identify ways to promote the caregiver-child relationship and think about these ways that are developmentally appropriate for this group of kids, right? Whether it's coloring different pictures and sending them back, reading books, there are lots of corrections-based programs that try to support the early literacy stuff by doing like read-to-me programs where dads and moms can read a storybook have it audio recorded and that, that audio recording and the book gets mailed home. Lots of great ways to support the caregiver-child relationship in that environment while also supporting the parent-child relationship from a distance. Um, guiding caregivers and setting expectations for parent-child contact. I think that this is one of the things that um, I see now more and more when I'm at the jail working with families who are there to visit. Uh, very few expectations for kids that are set about what that environment is like. Perhaps because the caregivers have never been there themselves and so they have no idea. They're walking into this environment highly anxious, they're stressed, they are tired, and they don't know what to expect getting ready to visit that parent for the first time and therefore they can't adequately support that child in that environment because they don't know the rules yet, they don't know what's happening, and there's all of this confusion that first time they walk into the facility. And so I think it's of critical importance, right, that we think with caregivers about how, when, when there is that contact, how it's purposeful and planful so that they're ready not only to respond to their own emotions about that environment, but how they can adequately respond to kids' emotions. Um, I was observing a visit one time at a local jail, and I was struck by the caregiver's use of the child needing to go to the bathroom in a really negative way. And the, caregiver, the child said, Mommy, I need to use the bathroom. Well, if, we, if you, you need to use the bathroom, this visit's going to be over. Do you want to see Daddy, or do you want to go to the bathroom? Because she knew, the caregiver knew, that if they got up and left to go to the bathroom, the visit would be over. They hadn't set that expectation from the beginning of the visit, and so now this little girl has to weigh this balance of, I really got to go potty, but I really want to see my dad. And that was a really, I mean, an unfair expectation to set on that child, where with a little bit of caregiver coaching, we could have prevented that situation from happening, right? With a little bit of education and helping caregivers know, this is the rule, make sure child goes to the bathroom beforehand, or I don't know, I mean, a crazy idea, let's change the policy so that kids can go to the bathroom and come back and see their parents. I know, not so square after all, right, Jason? Um, a rebel. So setting expectations. The other thing that I see a lot in the jail environment is caregivers uh, not really knowing how best to wrap up the visit. And so we see caregivers sort of saying, it's time to go. And there's no conclusion. There was no five-minute warning. There was no nothing. It's, well, we got to go now. Visit's over. And so then the kid is left in this really difficult situation of not really getting an and proper goodbye. This happens a lot with the video visitation type of visits now because actually what comes up on the screen is now that some of the systems have five minute warnings and it'll sort of flash on the screen, you have five minutes left. But those timed video visits cut off at 15 or 20 minutes or whatever the allotted time is. So you might be in the middle of saying goodbye and the video shuts off. Now as adults, we know how to deal with that, right? It would be disappointing, but imagine saying goodbye to a loved one and all of a sudden, like halfway mid-sentence, you don't get to say anything anymore. For a child, that's particularly difficult. And so helping caregivers set some expectation about what that visit environment is gonna be like, how it's gonna go, and how we can really support children in that environment, I think is critically important. 
so to prepare for and process the parent-child contact, and then supporting incarcerated parents in their roles as mothers and fathers. I think that this is something where our corrections departments across the state and across the country are really getting better at recognizing, oh, these aren't just offenders, they aren't just inmates, they aren't just felons, they're moms and dads. And that actually, if we want them to not come back into our system, supporting them in this role is really important, right? Perhaps they're less likely to recidivate if they go back into their communities and they feel connected with their families, they feel connected with their children, they recognize the value in that parent-child role. And so there's been a lot written about visitation and the visitation benefits for incarcerated parents. And I think that this is a place where we can think about how, when we think about all of the reentry services that happen for, um, for inmates, how do we add this element, this really critical element, so that they transition in this purposeful way. OK, and last, I want to just highlight some work that's been done with adolescents. So we know that around more than 50% are of children with incarcerated parents are between 10 and 17 years old. And we know that adolescence is a time of renegotiation of the caregiver-child relationship, right? A natural time in the developmental life course when kids want to take risks, they want to be independent, they want to assert their own opinions, and that's awesome because it's developmentally appropriate and it's a good thing. Um, this is when I think back to that kid who was calling his mom he wanted to do that. He wanted to make a choice. He wanted to have some autonomy in his life, right? And this is, of course, developmentally appropriate and would be a good thing. And I think in the context of incarceration, we have to really think about what this age group of kids needs. They have the ability to think abstractly and hypothetically. So you have opportunities in the context of working with adolescents to say, well, think about how that makes you feel. How would you feel if you went to visit your parent? How would you feel, how are you gonna feel when your dad returns? Little kids don't have that cognitive skills, but adolescents do, and so we can coach them around those conversations about you know, really abstract or hypothetical ideas. Uh, time for the development of complex emotions that weren't there in early childhood, and as I said, risk-taking is, of course, normative. One intervention strategy that's been used to approach kids with incarcerated parents in this developmental window is mentoring. Um, mentoring, of course, as Jason talks about, could be formal or informal mentoring. This idea that there is the importance of a meaningful relationship with a non-parental adult, uh, characterized by the elements that are critically important for all kids, but maybe particularly important for a group of kids who have had repeated loss or disappointment in close relationships. So characterized by mutual mutuality, trust, and empathy. And the trust piece here is critical for this group of kids. Because they've had, as I said, potentially a series of disruptions where people that they love and they trust have left them or are no longer in their lives. And so there are these really unique considerations for children of incarcerated parents. Um, in the early 2000s, the Bush administration put a lot of effort into faith-based initiatives for mentoring children of incarcerated parents. So there's a quote there from uh, George Bush. Tonight I ask Congress and the American people to focus the spirit of service and the resources of government on the needs of some of the most vulnerable citizens. Boys and girls trying to grow up without guidance and attention, and children who have to go through a prison gate to be hugged by their mom or dad. And so there was a lot of effort that was put into these types of mentoring programs, including Amachi, uh, which is probably one of the, the bigger household names uh, in this type of programming. So Amachi and many of the centers partnered with local Big Brothers Big Sisters when I was um, in graduate school for uh, at Wisconsin, we were working in partnership with our local Big Brothers Big Sisters chapter to evaluate the mentoring programs through the Mentoring Children of Prisoners funding. Um, and they have since expanded all over the country to Amachi-based models to provide uh, mentoring services for kids who have a parent incarcerated. I'm gonna skip this short video in the interest of time, but they've talked a lot about kind of why this particular intervention is really important. One thing I'll note, and I think, Jason, there's been a lot of renewed conversation about mentoring children of prisoners lately. Uh, in the fall, I was invited to the White House for the second time in a year. It's been a crazy, crazy year um, to talk about mentoring children of incarcerated parents specifically. Jason made a point about you know, how he wanted to be involved in mentoring programs, and he sort of said, and you all laughed, you know, they didn't really want him around their kids, right? 
And there was a lot of discussion at this White House session about, wait a second, aren't people like Jason who have been through it and gotten out the very people we want mentoring this group of kids that might be at high risk for engaging in the things that Jason already experienced? Don't we want people like Jason to say, dude, there's a better path, right? Don't go down that road. You could go down that road. I went down that road. And here are all the pitfalls of going down that road. And so there was long, this long discussion because of course, you have a felony on your record, and you're going to be quickly pulled out of the pool of applicants for most mentoring programs. There are really important implications for that, right? When you think about the very people who might be able to walk the walk and talk the talk, not being able to share that experience with, with this group of kids. So when I think about recommendations for practitioners working with adolescents, um, thinking about, and this is from uh, Mark Eddy, a colleague of mine, and has done a lot of work on mentoring children of prisoners. Thinking about the mentoring program in particular, having clear goals and protocols for what is the, how are we going to deal with the mentor, whether they know or don't know about the parent's incarceration. What is the mentor's expectation for sharing that information with the child or responding when the child has questions? So what if the, what if the mentor doesn't know the parent is incarcerated? Do they need to know? Can they better respond to kids' needs if and when they know? Um, having procedures specified for volunteer recruitment, screening, and training. In our work with the Big Brothers Big Sisters program in Dane County, Wisconsin, one of the things that we heard repeatedly was, you know, Big Brothers Big Sisters tells us that mentoring is free. But it can't be free if I show up to a kid's house and they haven't eaten in the last day. I, it's not free if I go to their house and the caregiver says, I'm not going to make rent because I'm a good person and I want to be able to help. But that training hadn't happened for mentors for this particular population. And so they were met with a lot more risks in the family environment than they were prepared or trained to deal with. Procedures are specified to facilitate the creation of good matches. And I think about this with school-based mentoring programs or informal mentoring programs as well. Mentors and youth meet weekly for at least one year. I come back to this point about the importance of sensitivity and consistency and expectations, whether that's expectations for visits for little kids or expectations for visits with their mentors for older kids. Kids need expectations. Kids thrive on expectations. And so when we think about mentoring or any program for kids, it's really important that we think about when will I see you again or what's going to happen next time and recognizing how important it is for those kids to recognize that you're going to be in their life. Mentors work with parents and support and honor the parent-child relationship. Lots of programs that have popped up thinking about ways to support the parent-child relationship. In some parts of the country, there are transportation services that recognize, and you'll see this in Mothers of Bedford too, that recognize the geographic barriers in visitation, and so actually have buses available that can transport kids to the local prison to see their parents. Um, so really understanding the importance of that parent-child relationship. Matches are monitored, supported, and reconsidered and changed if needed, uh, recognizing that we need to meet as practitioners and providers, meet kids where they're at with their developmental needs and the things that they're going through. And the mentoring program partners with families and other agencies to best engage the children of incarcerated parents and their families. Again, maybe not enough just to simply say, here's your mentor that you're going to meet with once a week over the course of the year. Um, but really think about what does that family need? Do they also need financial resources? Do they need housing support? What are the sort of comprehensive services that are going to help this family thrive so that this kid can get through middle school, get through high school, get to graduation? And finally here, uh, the mentoring program partners with other agencies and programs to connect children and families with those other needed services, as I talked about. So when I think about how this weaves through with what Jason talked about throughout his developmental story and what I would urge all of you to go on with in your days today and the work that you'll do after today is think about developmentally appropriate prevention and intervention services that are sorely needed for this group of kids. Recognizing that providers should strive to take a family perspective and consider caregivers, children's, and incarcerated parents' perspectives in this. So often I see programs that are targeting this population and it's just for the child, or it's just for the caregiver, or it's just for the incarcerated parent. But every one of you in this room knows that families are interconnected systems, 
And if we just do the intervention program with the parent, we're missing critical pieces of that family system, right? And that whatever we do over here may not be effective if we don't help both elements, all three elements of, of the family system. And then finally, services must recognize the heterogeneity in the population and identify ways to tailor services to families' unique needs. Uh, I hope that you took away from the keynote this morning that while we think about parental incarceration, there are so many nuances to this population and every single child's experience is different and their family experiences are different. And while they may share this collective experience of having a parent um, in jail or prison, that what they need and what they need now might be different than what they need two months from now or two years from now, and that we as providers can recognize those unique needs within the family and sensitively respond to those. So I will stop there, and I'm sure Carrie wants you to fill out your evaluations and has a couple of last comments. Just two quick things in addition to filling out the small green evaluation form and dropping it in the box on the way out. Um, we have a tight schedule, as you know, today, but we will have a lot of time in workshop three for question and answer and discussion for, with all our presenters, so please join us for that. And then right after lunch, during workshop two, we will see the film Mothers of Bedford. They're all in this room, so we will see you back then. Thank you.